the lectures will be posted on the web, so that's why we're doing this. But uh, uh, I recommend that you try to attend classes. It's uh, better to see things live. You can ask questions. And uh, I think in math, the interaction is quite important. So uh, there is a syllabus uh, going along. Uh, for those of you who had 341, same structure, two tests, one final, 30% uh, each, 10% for homework. Uh, these, for those who had not had 341, this is not uh, uh, an easy class for most people. So be prepared to work. Uh, you have usually uh, one week to do homework. So what I'll do is today I'll assign homework, on Thursday I'll assign more homework, but it will be due one week from Thursday. Okay. The reason why you have so much time is because it takes time to do it. So don't delay starting doing homework. The way you should approach this is uh, look at the problems, try to do them. You have problems with several of them, ask questions, talk to uh, others, and so on. Uh, come to see me during my office hours, and uh, try again. Okay, it's uh, something which is not supposed to come, or, or at least for most people, it's not something that you do right away. It's not calculus, it's, you need more reflection, you need to think about these things. Every Thursday when you hand down your homework, I'll go over all the problems. So you have a complete solution to all your problems. Once you have a solution, don't shelve it somewhere. Try to redo the problems you haven't been able to do without looking at the solution. Normally you have questions again, and you should ask these questions. So it's uh, something which you know takes some effort, but hopefully uh, it will be, you'll be all right. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Have you have you told them that uh, they were out of it? So, okay. So I'll give them a call. But they do that every semester. I'm not sure they have an algorithm like if 41 people are enrolled, then we'll do 35. It's a strange way to do things, but eventually you'll always all have it. Uh, meanwhile, if you don't, uh, send me an email. I'll send you a PDF file of the first chapter, okay, so that you don't stay without it. Anything else? OK, so let's start. So we'll, we'll go right quickly on chapter one. Uh, and so first chapter is number systems. And the first section is the algebra of rails. Okay, when you start, hi. There are some seats in the front there. So when we start doing mathematics, uh, we start with a set of rules. We start with some axioms. Okay, like in geometry, you have Euclid's uh, axioms, uh, five of them, and you use them to do everything. You prove everything based on these axioms. Axioms, by definition, are things that are not proved. Okay, they are given to you, and it's a set of rules, and you work with these rules. Now, it's a part of mathematics, uh, logic, which deals with this, uh, uh, the, with a question of knowing whether you need that many axioms, whether they are consistent or redundant, and so on. So this is. Uh, this kept busy many uh, very good mathematicians of the 20th century. The, to, to think about these questions. Uh, for us, the beginning is the natural numbers. So 
so it's the set well known set and even a set like this which is uh, completely natural I mean counting is something that uh, people have done for thousands of years well you, you, if you want to formalize things uh, and, and you should you, you have a set of axioms what, what do we mean exactly by the naturals what properties do they have uh, and this is contained in the so called uh, piano so that's the name of uh, an Italian mathematician, Axioms. Okay, so he gives five, five axioms in order to describe the naturals. Okay, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the axioms uh, later on. But they are completely, it's like, you know, one is in the naturals. If one number is in the naturals, when I add one, I also get a natural. That type of thing that, you know, doesn't seem really uh, very deep, but uh, uh, is necessary in order to describe this set. Once we have a natural numbers, we can uh, define the integers. So, uh, natural numbers, usually the notation will be an N like this. Uh, for the integers, we'll use a, a z like this, and so the only thing you are doing is adding zero and the negative numbers, and you you get the integers. And there there are uh, simple ways to construct the integers, uh, given that you have the naturals. And then uh, once you have integers, well, you need rationals. You need rationals because uh, integers, naturals are good for counting, but they are not very good for measuring. Okay, you want to measure something, then it's usually going to be uh, five meters and uh, a fraction of a meter. So you need fractions. And uh, so uh, usual notation for a rational is Q. And each rational has many different representations. Okay, so we're talking about numbers like this, and of course, uh, these fractions can be represented by different, uh, uh, like one half is two fourths, and so on. So, so this requires a little bit of mathematics already to to make sure that the object we are talking about is clearly defined, because it it may be represented by uh, different things. But we, we are not going to get into this. Just uh, uh, describe this rather informally. And finally, we have the real numbers. And the real numbers, well, uh, why, why do you need something else uh, since uh, you have rationals? For instance, square root of 2 does not belong to the rationals. Okay, so uh, the rationals are not big enough. Uh, how, how to think about real numbers? Well, that's the, the, the object of chapter 7 in the book, and I'm not sure we'll get there. But uh, if you want, you can have a look at it. One, one representation of real numbers which is useful is to think of real numbers as being a, a series like this. So uh, what one can show is that any real number in 0, 1, between 0 and 1, can be represented by an infinite series like this, where the di's are the decimal digits. So di is anything between uh, 0 and 9. And these objects represent all possible real numbers. This is, so there is, there is really a jump between rationals and reals in the sense that now you need the notion of limit. Okay, you cannot just do some algebra. You need something else. 
and uh, a real number is therefore a limit of uh, something rather simple because you know you you just have one over ten plus three over one hundred plus uh, uh, one over one thousand and so on. So you're adding things, fractions, decimal fractions that are rather easy. But then you take the limit of this thing. Once you take the limit, then you get uh, objects that are a lot more complicated. Okay, so that's uh, just to to set up a little bit what the different uh, uh, sets of numbers are. Okay, so uh, yes. You mean to say that once you take the limit, that's where the irrational numbers appear. So all the numbers, rationals and irrationals. Yes, but uh, you are right to point that when you take, when you are looking at the finite sum before you take the limit, you do have a rational number and a very simple one. And that's one of the many properties of the reals is that any real can be approached by a sequence of rational numbers. Okay, that's why we say that rational numbers are dense in uh, uh, real numbers. But, but no irrational number would could be represented by a finite sequence. An irrational number? No, otherwise, you, because any, any finite sum is going to be rational. So you're not, never going to get uh, an irrational number by doing that. So my question was then, what, when you take the limit to infinity, that's when the irrational number Absolutely. appears. Absolutely. It's by taking the limit that you get all these new numbers that uh, you, you didn't get before. Yeah. Okay, so what we're going to do is, uh, we're first thing some notation. Okay, we need, uh, before we go on, So uh, we have, for instance, the set of x's so that uh, x squared is equal to 2. So we use braces for this type of notation. And in English, this is the set of real numbers whose square is 2. Okay, that's what we're saying here. We're looking at all the rails that have a certain condition. Okay, that's a notation we'll use all the time. Uh, another example. So now we're looking at over rails that are larger than or equal to minus 1 or strictly and strictly less than 2. Another notation for this is the, the interval notation, minus 1, 2. Okay, when, when I have a bracket, it means that the minus 1 is included. That's because this inequality here is large. And the parenthesis is for 2 not included. So it's strict. Okay, so that's reserved for sets of frills that are this type. Sets that have no hole. Okay, this set tells me that I'm taking over rails between one bound and the other bound. So that's an interval. And I can use this notation. Another uh, useful one is the set minus 1 to 4. 
So again, um, with braces, it means that I'm describing something. Whether the something is a set of three elements, minus one, two, and four. Okay. Be very precise in the way you write mathematics. Okay. A good uh, one, one important problem most of you have is that you are not precise enough in your notation. Okay, if you not, if you write things precisely, you get rid already of uh, half uh, your problems. So be very precise about what you're writing. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, uh, properties of the reals. And uh, of course you you know all that, and we are going to uh, move a little quick quickly here. Uh, for instance, so first property: if x is in R and y is in R, and that's a notation I haven't introduced yet, but this means x belongs to R. Okay, y belongs to R. Then x plus y belongs to r. Okay, you add two reals, you get a real. Uh, addition is an internal operation in the reals. Now, uh, it's also the case that you can interchange your addition and you get the same thing. Uh, you also have associativity, of course. When you are adding x plus y plus z, you get also the same thing when you do first y plus z and then you add x. Uh, you have a neutral element, which is 0. So x plus 0 is 0 plus x is x for every x. And. Uh, you also have an inverse element for addition, which is that for each x in R, there is x prime also in R, so that x plus x prime is 0. Okay, every time you have an x, you can find uh, another x and x prime so that the addition gives me 0. And of course, the notation is x prime is minus x. That's, that's how we write our uh, x prime. We say it's minus x. That's the definition of minus x. So. Uh, these five properties are, should be familiar if you have taken some algebra. This is called a group. It's an abelian group. Okay? Abelian because you can, you can interchange your operation here. Uh, the other thing which uh, you, you have the same properties for multiplication. So I'm not going to write them, but if you look at page 2, uh, from F6 to F10, we have exactly the same properties, except that we replace the addition by a multiplication. So when you do that, uh, everything is true, except that instead of a 0, now your, uh, your neutral element for multiplication is 1. Okay, that's one thing. The other thing is that uh, for the multiplication, your x cannot be 0. If uh, your x is not 0, then you have an x prime, which is this time 1 over x, such that x times 1 over x gives you 1. Okay, so it's the same structure, but uh, uh, with multiplication. And the last property, which is F11, is the distributivity property, which links addition and multiplication. Okay? It tells you what to do when you have uh, the two operations in the same expression.
So f11 is x plus y times z is x z plus y z. Okay, and of course you can do it on the other side because it's so it's commutative, and you get the same thing. So these are the properties of the rails, but these are also the properties of the rationals, for instance. The rationals have exactly the same 11 properties. So at this point, we don't see really the difference between the two sets. In order to see the difference, you have to wait until a later section where we'll see a property which is called the fundamental property of the rails that makes the distinction between rationals and rails. Okay, now uh, consequences of, yeah. I have a quick question. Do we, um, do we have to notate here that x is equal to x? Uh, yeah, you're right. We, we would need to define what we mean by equal and what, what is this relation. And yes, we can, so What's you would, it's, it's a relation between two numbers. But it doesn't have a name like associativity and, and all the other names? No, what it has is uh, it has several properties like symmetry, the one you are talking about, x equal x, uh, I'm sorry, reflexivity rather, x, x equal x. It has symmetry, which is if x is y, then y is x. And it has transitivity, which is if x is y and y is z, x is z. Okay. okay. But I don't want to go too much into this because this is not an algebra course and you'll be disappointed and you won't come back for next time. So uh, I, I want to go, I want to tell you a little bit about these structures, but not too much because this is really, uh, this should be done in algebra. Of course, uh, my colleague in algebra disagrees, but that's uh, another issue. So uh, let's look a little bit at consequences. of these 11 properties. For instance, one, one fundamental thing is that when you do 0 times x, you find 0. Okay. Uh, can we prove that using the 11 properties? Well, it's uh, not very difficult to prove, actually. We can start by, so proof will be, okay, let's, let's use our different rules and say the following, well, I can, uh, I can, I'm doing that, I'm saying that 0 plus 0 is 0. I know that because 0 is a neutral element. So whatever I, I add 0 to remains the same. So if I add 0 to 0, I still get 0. So this is a true statement. And that's because 0 plus 0 is 0. Now I use this to, yeah? Or, or potentially it could just be the... Um, well, it could just be the distributive property. Oh, I'm going to need the distributive property now. We, we need both. So by the distributive property, we know that this is 0x plus 0x. And it's also equal to 0x. And then we, uh, and, and that, that should uh, be one of the properties of equality. Uh, but we, we are going to skip that, is that we are going to be able to add minus 0x on both sides. So we do 0x plus 0x minus 0x equal to 0x minus 0x. So what I have done here is say that if a is equal to b, then by adding the same thing on both sides, I still have an equality. Okay, that, that comes from the definition of what equal means. Okay, you can define being equal as being the, the difference equal to zero. So anyway, we'll, uh, we'll just uh, uh, admit that without going into that. So, zero, so here I should use associativity to group things as I want, uh, and uh, we know we can. So 0x minus 0x, by definition, is zero. So we get that 0x plus 0 is equal to 0. Now, 0x plus 0 is 0x. 
And that's what we wanted. We want to show that 0 times x is 0. Okay, so we are done. So that's an important fact. Now, the other, uh, the second property I'd like to talk about is that if x, y is 0, then x is 0 or y is 0. And here we do a proof by contradiction. So let's talk a little bit, because that's something that will come up uh, quite often. What is a proof by contradiction? Well, assume that you want to prove that A implies B. Okay, that's what, you're, what we are trying to prove here. We are trying to prove that if x, y is 0, then x is 0 or y is 0. Well, if we uh, do a proof by contradiction, it means that we are going to uh, say that we may have uh, non, uh, we may have A and non B. Okay, that's the contradiction of this. Okay, instead of having A implies B, I say no, A does not imply B since I can have A and not B. And we do a logical uh, implication, we do logical implication starting here, and we reach something which contradicts what our hypothesis is, which was this. Okay, so that's the idea of uh, proof by contradiction. So, in this case, we're going to say xy is 0 and x is 0, x is not 0, and y is not 0. Okay? So we are saying A, so we are keeping the VA as it is, and non B. But what is B? B is x is 0 or y is 0. How do I contradict x is 0 uh, and y is 0? I say, well, x is not 0 and y is not 0. That's non-B. OK. If that's the case, then if x, uh, let's say, is not 0, then x has an inverse. one over x. It, we know that the only numbers that have inverses are the numbers that are not 0. So I can do that because I am assuming that x is not 0. Therefore, it must have an inverse 1 over x. But then I use uh, xy equals 0, and I do 1 over x times xy equal to 1 over x times 0. So what I'm saying now is that since x, y is 0, I'm allowed to multiply both sides by the same quantity. That's again a property of the equality. So uh, now by associativity, I could say that this is 1 over x times x times y. And 1 over x times 0 is 0 according to what we just did here. We say that 0 times anything is 0. So that's what I'm using. So we get uh, 1 over x times, uh, times x uh, is 1. And this is y equal to 0. And we end up with y equals 0. So we have our contradiction. Okay? The contradiction comes from the fact that we assumed when we started this that y was non-zero. And we concluded that y is 0. Okay, Our assumption was y is not 0. 
But then we do a computation and we find y is zero. That's a contradiction, therefore, that cannot be true. So by contradiction, we are proving that A implies B, because A and non-B cannot hold. Questions? Yeah? Um, on the right side of the board there, you know, it's, it's very tempting to jump from the first statement to the third statement, uh, just because, of course, we know that works. Is it important that we follow the base each step on the properties of the reals that we not no, uh, I mean I'm doing it uh, step by step because I want you to use the, the to think about the different properties we are using. But of course, you you will jump, uh, in particular because uh, the the main purpose will be uh, to use these properties we are proving for doing uh, different type of inequalities where you won't need to do the algebra actually. I mean, of course you need to do the algebra, but the point will not be to prove some algebra properties. So that's only for today really. Okay, so I don't want to spend too much time on these things. There are several other things that uh, are proved there and that you can look over. Uh, but now I'd like to now I'd like to talk about ordering. So that's going to be. Uh, now we, we define uh, another relation between real numbers besides equality, which is smaller than or uh, smaller than. Uh, so uh, we have the following properties. So I call the first one O1. And uh, if you have X and Y in R, you have three possibilities. Either x is less than y, or x is y, or x yeah, or y is less than x. So that's quite important because it means that this, with this relation, you can compare any two reals okay, in, uh, in your set, which uh, you don't have this in R2, for instance. Okay? If you're looking at couples of reals, you are not going to have a relation where you can compare all of it. Okay? Uh, just think about it. You have two coordinates, you can compare the two first coordinates, but uh, probably not the second one. Or it depends what you choose to compare. But anyway, you are not going to have something total like this, where you, you can write what I just wrote there. That's because uh, uh, the real C is a line, of course. Now, uh, second uh, property, if x is less than y and y is less than z, then x is less than z. And that's the transitivity of this relation. Now, O3 gives us a uh, relation between smaller than and addition. So if x is less than y, then x plus z is less than y plus z. Okay, so I'm allowed to add anything I want on both sides. And the fourth one is going to give us a relation between smaller than and multiplication. So if x is positive and y is positive, then xy, x times y is also positive. So with these four properties, 
You can prove everything else, you know, about uh, uh, multiplication, uh, addition, and uh, uh, inequalities. Uh, for instance, first consequence of these uh, different properties, if x is less than y and z is a positive real, then xz is less than yz. Okay, so what we do is uh, we add minus x on both sides. So proof of that we start by adding minus x on both sides. That's allowed by O3. If x is less than y, I can add z on both sides. So that's what I'm doing. Okay, I'm adding minus x, which is the same thing as putting minus x here. Now we know that this is 0, so this is y minus x. Then uh, we are going to multiply across by, uh, so by z, right? Yeah, so we have that y minus x is positive and z is positive. Therefore, we can use this property here that tells us if you have two positive numbers, you multiply them, you still get something positive. So uh, z is positive. I put these two together and I use O4, and that tells me that z times y minus x is also positive. Okay, then distributivity, zy minus zx, and then O3 again, we add zx on both sides, and we get that zy is bigger than zx, and we are done. Okay, um, second property, well, if, okay, we're not going to do it, but let me state it. If x is less than y and z is negative, this time we get that x z is bigger than z y. Okay, of course you return the inequality, and it's done exactly in the same fashion as uh, C1, so I'm not going to do it. C3, let's assume that x is bigger than y is bigger than 0, then x squared is bigger than y squared. So how do we do this? Uh, well, one way to do it is to say since x is bigger than y and x is positive, we have shown in C1 that when you multiply across by a positive number, you get the same inequality stays uh, true. So you get x times x bigger than y times x. And x times x is x squared, by definition, bigger than yx. And then uh, you start this, 
that's your starting point. You take this inequality, and this time you multiply across by y. So if you do that, you get that uh, yx is bigger than yy, which is y squared. So you get that uh, yx is bigger than y squared. And now you have that x squared is bigger than yx, and that yx is bigger than y squared. So that's the transitivity of uh, the relation that you use. This implies that x squared is bigger than y squared. Okay? Of course, yeah? I think all of the uh, things in the book probably greater than less than signs are backwards. Oh, bad news. Where is it? Okay, we'll read from uh, right to left. Oh, okay. Okay, so I, I, I stated x bigger than y, and I proved starting by x less than y. Thank you. Of course, uh, this, be careful with these uh, relations. Uh, keep in mind the parabola and the fact that you, you do have an increasing function when your x and y are positive, but it's decreasing if your x and y are negative. So the same property here is reversed if you're talking about uh, uh, negative numbers. And that, that will be part of your homework. So uh, let's see what else. Yeah, another uh, something else that we need to do is talk about uh, the inverse, which is uh, the other important function here. So assume that x is positive, then 1 over x must be positive as well. So uh, that would be um, the following. If so we do again a, a proof by contradiction. If 1 over x is uh, less or equal to 0, so that's something important. Uh, when you are contradicting 1 over x strictly bigger than 0, it means that this is not true. But between two numbers, we know that there are three possibilities. Either it, 1 over x is bigger than 0, or it's equal, or it's smaller than, strictly smaller than. So when you are Taking the contradiction of this, don't forget to put that it may be equal to. Okay? Now, when you multiply this across by x, because x is positive, you still get the relation in the same direction. And then x times 1 over x is 1 by definition, and so you get that 1 is less than or equal to 0. This is, again, using the properties we have stated, this is something you can prove that 1 is strictly bigger than 0. Okay, you can try to think about how you would prove that using the properties. But anyway, so this is a contradiction. and proof C4. Now for C5, we have that uh, if x is bigger than y is bigger than 0, then 1 over x is less than 1 over y. So the proof of that is starting with 
xy is positive, that's one of uh, uh, the two, the O4. When you, you have two positive numbers, then the product is positive. Then by what we just proved, we know that 1 over xy is positive. And then uh, we get that. OK, so now we use this. So we use that uh, x is bigger than y by hypothesis. And now we multiply by a positive number on both sides. And we get 1 over y on this side, and we get 1 over x on this one. And we are done. Okay, so this, uh, again, it's a function you need to keep in mind. Function 1 over x. Okay, it's decreasing on the positive numbers. It's decreasing on the negative numbers. But uh, you cannot say anything between the two. Okay, you, you need to know what the sign of your numbers is in order to find the relation between the two. Questions? OK, so let's uh, uh, move on to triangular inequalities and absolute value. So definition, uh, absolute value of x is x if x is positive over 0, and is minus x if x is negative over 0. So that's uh, how we define absolute value. And uh, uh, one lemma which is quite useful So lemma is a stepping stone. Yeah? I thought the absolute value made x always greater than or equal to 0. Right. So then how does the bottom one apply? I don't I really understand that. I understand what it's saying. It's just that if you're dealing with an absolute value, x will always be greater than 0. So how would x be negative? So let's, let's take x equal to negative 2. By my definition, negative 2 is negative, so in order to take the absolute value, I need to do minus minus 2. Oh, okay. And I get 2. All right, I Sorry. Okay? No, it's just a notation. So, uh, yeah, or, uh, I mean, this confuses people. Uh, minus x may be positive or negative. It depends what x does, of course. Does, so just keep that in mind. Uh, a lemma is not a result that one has to memorize, but it's a useful stepping stone to prove other things. Okay. And uh, uh, what, we, what this one says is the following. First thing, take A to be strictly positive. Then uh, we are going to say that then x e in absolute value is less than a or equal to a if and only if we have this. Um, so in particular, uh, I'll use uh, two notations. I'll say if and only if, or I'll use a double uh, arrow like this. If and only if is uh, means that you have two things to prove. Okay, if this is true, then this is true, and if this is true, then that that must be true too. 
This implication from left to right is usually called the direct implication. Okay, so you, you need to prove this and then the indirect one from right to left. So what's a pain with uh, absolute values is that you need to distinguish De depending on what uh, uh, your x is, your, ex your expression is different. So, but that's, that's the way it is. You need to do that. Every time you have absolute values, you have several cases, two cases to consider. So let's do the direct implication first. So let's assume that absolute value of x is less than a. And you have two possibilities, two cases. First case, x is positive. Then uh, x is, absolute value of x is x, and x is less than or equal to a. Okay, that's because the absolute value of x is x. And you are assuming that absolute value of x is less than a. So x must be less than a. Then uh, for the other inequality, because you, we, we have two things to show here. x less than a and x larger than minus a. So x is less than a and uh, since minus a is negative, we also know that x is bigger than minus a. That's because we are assuming that x is positive. So x is going to be larger than any negative number. Okay? So in the case x positive, we put together the two inequalities and we are done. Questions? So second case, x is negative. If x is negative, then absolute value of x is minus x. And we know that absolute value of that's our hypothesis. Absolute value of x is less than a, which means that minus x is less than a. And that means that x is bigger than minus a. Now, uh, the other inequality is easier again because, because x is negative, and a is positive, x must be less than a. So we have our two inequalities. x is between minus a and a. OK, so the direct implication is proved. And it's really not difficult. It's just uh, a little painful because you have to look at two cases. Now for the other implication, what we are going to do is uh, simply say that, OK, now so the other implication is uh, that if x is between minus a and a, then absolute value of x is less than a. That's what we want to prove. So again, first case, x is positive. Then absolute value of x is x. 
But I know already by hypothesis that the x is less than a. That's what I'm assuming. So I can write it here. And we are done with this case. Now, if x is negative or 0, then absolute value of x is minus x. And uh, minus x, so if we look at this, I want smaller than, is minus x. So we have minus a less than x. If we multiply across by minus 1, we get that a is bigger than minus x. But that's absolute value of x, according to what we said here. So again, we have absolute value of x less than or equal a. And we're done. Okay, that's, that's what we want to prove. Okay, so this is typical of uh, uh, proofs involving absolute values. Now, uh, graphically, the lemma is simply saying the following. You have minus a here, 0 here, a here. It's a good idea to represent the reals as a straight line, as you, you have done since little, I'm sure. And uh, uh, what the lemma is telling us is simply that in order for the absolute value of x to be less than a, you need to have your x between minus a and a. If your x is outside this interval, its absolute value is going to be bigger than a. That's all we are saying here. Now, triangle inequality. For all a, b in R, Absolute value of a plus b is less than absolute value of a plus absolute value of b. Okay, proof. Um, yeah. First thing, why is this always a true statement? Because it's either one or the other. Exactly. One or if A is positive, then I have an equality here and I have an inequality here because this is a negative number. If A is negative, then this is A, and so this is true, and it's more than something positive because it's negative. Okay, so this is always a true statement. Now we can say the same thing for B. And we can add across the, the inequalities to get this. We are just adding everything, and we are going to we get this double inequality. Now, um, if we call this guy capital A, and this guy X, what, what this thing is really telling me is that minus A is less than X, which is less than A. Okay. So, I can use the lemma, and the lemma tells me that this is equivalent to absolute value of x less than a. We agree? So, what is absolute value of x? Now, going back to our uh, notation.
I'm done. Absolute value of x is absolute value of a plus b, because this is what x is. And it's more than capital A, but capital A, we say is no. no. That's not what a x a is. X is a plus b. It's more than a, and a is capital of a, uh, absolute value of a plus absolute value of b. Which is the triangular inequality? Okay. Okay. Let me assign some homework. So this will be for the thirty-first next Thursday. Will you be um, copying this onto a web page, Lister? I'm sorry. Will you be copying the number, the homework problems, onto the web page? Lister? Yeah. Yeah, my, my website will have a homework assignment. Okay. So uh, what we have here is section 1-1 one, one, and 1-3-4-5. Uh, Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fourteen. Yeah, that's good. Uh, okay, now I realize I still uh, let me just. Uh, give you this algebraic in identity because you'll need it for homework and also will be done with the section 1.1 if I do that. So just uh, uh, something from algebra but which turns out to be quite useful in many situations. Of course, we all know that a squared minus b squared is a minus b times a plus b. Now, it turns out that you have a nice generalization of this thing. Uh, like this, a cubed minus b cubed is a minus b. And then you write down all the power 2 products you can make up which is a square, a, b, power 1, power 1, that's power 2, b square, and so on. So a, a 4 minus b 4 will be a minus b, a cube, plus a square b, plus a b square, plus b cube, and so on. OK, so. Uh, can we just simplify those on those sides? Simplify. Oh. No, they're not the same. No, no, you, you cannot do better than that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so I have also, uh, you, you have the formula for general n in all its beauty. Let me write it. Oh, it's from zero, okay. Okay, and this works probably from n uh, four and on. Okay, so it's just uh, an algebraic uh, identity. Of course, the way you can prove this thing is simply by expanding here and seeing that everything cancels except for this term and this term. Okay, so that's uh, not a big deal, but it turns out that we need this uh, several times. Questions? Okay, so let's stop here. Usually I finish early, so it's a good time to ask questions if you have. Okay, I don't... Uh, 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 I'll be here to answer your questions if you have any.